Hello, good day, and welcome back to Go on the Run. And today, I'm going to wrap up pot storage. And that's not because there isn't any more to learn. There's just so much, but we just can't keep learning, you know, and going deeper and deeper. But for most of us, if we're using Kubernetes just for testing and day-to-day -day stuff, we don't need to get into too much into the weeds. But with that said, today we're talking about persistent volumes. So let's jump in. So let's start with the Kubernetes documentation. And so if we go to docs, concept, storage, and then we click on persistent volumes, you can see that how you can, um, it describes what a persistent volume, why you need it, blah, blah, blah. And notice it, you can read the details, but I'm just gonna go through it very quickly. It says, managing storage is a distinct problem from managing compute instances. The persistent volume subsystem provides an API for users and administrators to abstract that abstract the detail of how storage is provided from how it is consumed, right? So keep that in mind. We want to abstract or separate how storage is provided from how it's used or consumed, right? To do this, we introduce two new API resources, the persistent volume and the persistent volume claim. So what are those two things? The persistent volume is a piece of storage in the cluster that has been provisioned by an administrator or dynamically provisioned using storage classes. We'll ignore that bit. It is a resource in the cluster just like a node in a, is a node in a, res, in a cluster resource. PVs or persistent volumes are volume plugins like volumes but have a life cycle independent of any individual part. That's the key right there. The life cycle of a persistent volume is independent or outside the life cycle of a pod. That's how it tells you right there. That tells you right there that if you're using persistent volume, that your pod can be destroyed, restored, whatever, and the data is still going to be there. Okay, and this is different than when we when we had empty um, directory, which had a life cycle that was tied to the pod. And the only other thing that we've seen so far that has a life cycle outside the pod was you know config map, but as we know that is only limited to injecting configuration that you've already defined. Now we're talking about storage that you can read and write to if you need to. Okay. And so, um, yeah, so, but I have a life cycle that's independent of any individual part that uses that persistent value. This API object captures the detail of the implementation of the storage, be that NFS, iSCSI or any cloud provided specific storage. So that's what a persistent volume is. It abstracts how exactly the storage is implemented, um, how it's provided, and then the pod gets to consume it. Now, what is the persistent volume claim? Well, there's an int right there claim. So the persistent volume claim, or you might see it as PVC, is a request for storage by a user. It is similar to a pod. So pod consume node resources and persistent volume claim consume PVC resources. Because remember, they're making the comparison here that a persistent volume is similar to a node. A node in a cluster com provides compute resource so that your pods can run. And a persistent volume in a cluster provides storage that your pods can consume. And so pods can request specific levels of resources, CPU and memory. So that's what we get from the node. And a claim can request specific size and access mo mode. Example, they can be mounted, read, write, read, men, only many, and those other sort of thing, right? So while persistent volume claim allow a user to consume abstract storage resource, it is common that users need persistent volumes with variant properties such as performance, blah, blah, blah. So this is just getting into the details now, the different types of persistent volumes you might have. Some might be slow, but some might be fast, that sort of thing. But ignoring all that, now we have an idea of a persistent volume being this thing that abstract how the storage is provided. It's persistent volume claim that sort of carves up and take a piece of that and the pod then consume the physics and volume claim. Okay, so now let's jump to our illustration so we can have a better picture of what they describe here in text. And of course, you can read more about the life cycles and all this other stuff and binding and stuff like that. So in our Kubernetes cluster, we have a pod, this green pod, and those little circles are the containers that are in this pod. So this pod has three containers. And what do we want? We want to be able to define a volume so that these containers can mount that volume, right? 
and we know that our volumes are defined at the pod level. That's still true and it's going to remain true. So if we can define a volume, then one or more of our pods can mount it. So that's where you see that little, the little gray container is using this volume that is defined in this pod. Okay, all good. We've done this before. Previously, all we've seen is that our volumes are either empty directories that are then created by the pod and therefore tied to the pod, or config map, which was the only thing that says that it was the storage or the information was actually coming from outside the pod. But that was the only other one, right? Config map. Remember, our persistent volumes are something that's separate from the cluster in the sense that oh, it is just defining how data is stored or persisted. And you could think of those as if they are nodes in the cluster, but they don't have to have to be in the cluster. It's just some storage that's outside or not tied to specifically to um, the details of your Kubernetes cluster, right? Like like I said, it's going to be NFS for net, um, for Unix type um, network file system or iSCSI, and those things could be services that are provided outside your cluster, as we're going to see today. And so my persistent storage could be iSCSI. It could be self, right, um, um, cluster file system, or NFS, like I said, the Unix network file system, um, or any number of other file storage um, technology. And your service provider, if you're using GCE or AWS or Azure or any other cloud provider that provides Kubernetes as a service, they're going to have their online storage system that you don't have to worry about. So that's why I put them as separate from the cluster. There is some Kubernetes specific storage technology like Longhorn and others that actually uses the node within the cluster to provide storage, but I don't want to talk about those. So that's why I show persistence here as being separate from the cluster. Okay, so where does the persistent volume come in? Well, the persistent volume is a Kubernetes resource. So it now looks like if it's something in the cluster, right? So you define a persistent volume for Kubernetes and you say, hey, this thing is really getting storage through via NFS, or it could be anything else, right? So you could have multiple persistent volumes. I could have another persistent volume that then says, oh, this is for I this is getting backed up by iSCSI. And again, where the storage is implemented is separate from the fact that though I've now defined persistent volume within Kubernetes. So now these become like almost like node resources that you can carve up. Just like how you can, when you have a node and you create a pod, the pod uses some CPU and memory. Now we have persistent volume as a storage resource, but now I need to carve it up. And so we can then say that, oh, let's create persistent volume claims. The persistent volume claims are going to be how we're going to use and determine access rights and all this other stuff against this persistent volume. That's what we carve up. Just like we carve up node resource by CPU and um, RAM amount. Here's the same thing. We're going to carve up this persistent um, volume the same way. And our pod now have access to this NFS storage via, you know, the indirection of being able to get a persistent volume claim that is tied to that volume. And then of course, there's some volume tied to the persistent volume. And of course, that is saying where this NFS resource is. So why would we want it? Well, let's say um, our pod was to be destroyed for some reason. Something happened and our pod is destroyed. Well, what we can do then is we know that if we're using a deployment, we'll get that pod restored with all the containers. And of course, the description for the volume, which means it can establish now a connection back to the storage, um, persistent storage was using. But even though you see this line from the volume to the persistent claim, volume claim and the persistent volume claim is in the persistent volume and the persistent volume points to the NFS, the data doesn't actually travel that path. The data actually goes directly from the pod over the network to the NFS. So we talk about pod networking before. So there it is. That's how we're able to now have storage that's outside the life cycle of our pod. Because notice our pod was able to go away, you know, our pod died and was restored. And the data, because it was stored 
in NFS or whatever you know external storage technology you're using, the data will still save them. So okay, so let's see how this works on with some examples. So you can see I have the watch command running here with the um you know executing kubectl get pv so it's persistent volume persistent volume claims parts and any deployment right and um my on the bottom pane I'm already in a directory called episode 26.13.03 and blah 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 right so that just saves us some time so what do I have here in my VS code so I'm already in that directory I open um, this directory I have three files I have a deployment file I have a persistent persistent volume claim file I have a PV um, YAML file the persistent volume claim and the persistent volume file are empty but I already written some code for the deployment because we have done this several times so pretty easy um, just literally type deployment if you're using VS code the plugin and um, you have the Kubernetes plugin this is the default and so I just changed the name to my app deployment that's the name of it and then I have one container defined which is called my app nginx and you know of course it's nginx and it mounts a volume called store one onto the path slash store one very creative and so here is my volume defined at this pod level now this is empty directory volume so we want to change this to be a persistent volume claim so we simply change this to persistent volume claim there we go and so you can see this tells you that our you know persistent volume pre represent a reference to a persistent volume claim in the same namespace well we haven't talked about namespace but and all we have is the claim name is the only thing we have to provide we can say whether it's read only but we don't want read only volume we're going to be able to write it and so what is our claim name well we haven't defined our persistent volume claim yet but here's the end let's just call it pv claim nfs right so let's use that same name and so now we need to define that persistent volume claim because this needs to refer to that persistent volume claim and so we want a kubernetes persistent volume claim so notice I type that, I go here. All I need to do is give it a name. Well, the name must match this. And then the size, we will give it, let's say 200 megabytes. And we're saying that oh, the thing that's being injected is a file system. Like you can inject a block device. If block device versus file system doesn't make sense to you, just ignore it and just leave it as file system. That's what you're gonna wanna use most of the time anyway. And the access mode is read, write once. You can read up on the access mode. We're not going to spend time. Just notice you can click the link right here to go and read up on that stuff. So we'll leave it. Two things. Change the name. I give the size. Okay. So now that we have a um, persistent volume um, claim, there's only one other thing that I want to um, sort of specify here. And that is the um, persistent volume class. So storage volume class name. And this is storage volume class name is the name of the storage class required by the claim. So essentially, if you leave this out, um, Kubernetes is going to be do its best to get the claim to make um, to get data from the default class. But since we don't, if we don't have a default class or um, we don't have a storage defined in that default class, the default class, then um, we need to specify the class name. So I'm going to say this class name is, let's just call it slow. It can call it anything. Um, basically, it's a way to be able to link this claim to other um, persistent volume that share the same class name. And you'll see what I mean in a minute. So let's come over here now and define our persistent volume. So let's give this persistent volume the name pv dash NF, NFS, a Linux network file system. What do we have to change? Well, the size of it, we can change um, the size. So I'm going to say this is probably like four gigs. That's fine. But it doesn't really matter because um, the host that I'm going to use is a lot more space. But this just sort of give Kubernetes an indication of how it should limit use of that um, backend store, right? Because you might not want your close your um, pods to write more than four gigs to that um, backend storage even if it has more okay um, so that's why I'm limited to like four gigs but there's a lot more storage there on that 
host. So where's my NFS server? Uh, my NFS server is on the IP address 10.10.100.10. And the share that I've created and exposed over there is on volume two slash K8S storage, okay? Now, you don't have to give it this name. This is not gonna exactly work for you because you have to set up an NFS server. You have to expose it. All this other, create the share and export it. All that is beyond what we're doing here with Kubernetes. So this is one of those places where what I've done here exactly wouldn't work for you unless you already have an NFS server or some other type of supported storage. So if you want to have like an NFS server, that's beyond this video. And so, sorry, but um, I already have an NFS server and all this other stuff and it will just distract and take too long to go into how to set up all that stuff. But I want to show you that all oh, this stuff work and at least you have an idea. But again, if you're doing this for everyday stuff and testing Kubernetes, you don't really need NFS storage, right? You can use empty directory or whatever. When you, if you have to do this in a way that you actually need storage that persists outside the pod, at that point, you need to talk to somebody else. Or if this is your job, then you, of course, know how to do the other stuff. So I'm going to ignore the whole recycle and all these other things and just leave it as is. So what we've done so far, we can see the connection now. My pod defines a storage called storage one that is used by this nginx container that storage has a claim which is defined by this persistent value claim here and this claim is um used you know provided or is tied to some storage class called slope and as you can see over here this persistent value has the same storage class called slope you could change the name to match up if you like so if i give this a different name and I have a persistent volume that didn't have the same name, that means that uh, those persistent volume claim would not come out of this storage volume. So what is the purpose of your storage class name? Well, think of having multiple persistent volume that have the same storage class name, even though the storage might come from the same type of backend storage or not, it doesn't really matter. But when you create persistent volumes because you use the same storage class name, now Kubernetes can make a decision about which one of those persistent volumes to use based on the size that they claim to have and the size of the claim that's being requested. If that doesn't make sense, just stick to following it verbatim and don't worry about it. Um, when you read the documentation and so on, it's going to make sense. So right now we have pretty much everything we need to run this example, except two things I have to let you know. One, you want to use a kind cluster at least I, for me, that's what only thing um, Kubernetes cluster that work on my desk on my machine locally, and um, I had to comment out this NFS version. So now that we have that in place, let's just go create our um, thing. So what we're gonna do, we could actually run all the files, you know, everything in a directory. But I want to show you piecemeal how it sort of builds up. So we can say kubectl apply minus f, and let's just create our persistent volume first. And when I do that, you will see that what's going to show up here says persistent volume, the size, you know, the capacity, and the access mode available, and you know, our storage class that we define. The next thing we can do, notice on the claims, there are no claims. So next thing we can do is create our claim. I can say you don't have to create them in order. If you create the volume for the claim first and there's no volume for it, like remember I said, if there's no storage class defined for your claim, Kubernetes is trying to do the default storage class, but if you actually specify a storage class, it will just wait until there's a volume. It will say pending. Okay, so here you can see now that though because we define a storage class, now Kubernetes can say, oh, you want a claim against a storage class called slow. Oh, there is a persistent volume with a storage class class called slow. So try to say that ten times fast. So now it can say that though, notice that there's this claim for in this volume. Okay, and if we had multiple claim, we'll just see them show up for this volume, persistent volume. And we can see that oh, it is tied to this volume, which makes sense because a persistent volume is sort of like a child of a persistent volume, which means that oh, each persistent volume claim can only be bounded to one and only one persistent volume. But any persistent volume might have multiple claim, claims, which is what I showed in the presentation. All right, so now that we have that, let's clean up again and let's do kubectl apply minus f 
and let's do our deployment finally and then we can see kubectl describe and we can see pod and the part we want to describe is my deployment um, blah 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 and then you can see here it's successfully you know assigned default blah 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 to the control plane it pulled the image it successfully pulled the image and how long it took to pull it it created the container and you can see one of one is ready so it is running so what we can do is cd now not cd shell into that deployment into that sorry that pod and we can do that by you know if we do clear kubectl exec minus interactive and we want to go into the pod this pod here so if we just copy this name for example like this and we just paste it and then you can say dash dash the command we want to run is bash and then we do that now we're inside of that pod and so we can see the into store one if you remember that's the name we give it and there's nothing it's empty right now we can to make a directory you know minus p a b and then you know c and d as children of the b directory and we can see you know if we do ls minus l r t we can see all those directory a a b d and a b c um now we can create a file we can say echo host name was here now we can put that in a file called this.txt and now we have a directory a and this file that we've created and so let's just exit this um container and what we're going to do is we could kill the container um we could kill the, the, the um the pod and see that it gets recreated so right now the pod name ends in tgr right kptgr so let's kill it so we do q ctl delete pod and we can delete this pod and notice how it's deleted and then immediately it's recreated because our deployment said that there must be one pod running always even if we kill that pod we get some we get another one so here's here's our new pod and so now we can say kubectl exec minus it and we can go into this pod again sky oh notice it's a different one okay and we do minus minus and we go into this new pod and if we go to the store one directory and if we do clear and do ls we should see our files there and there they are if we do cat this we can see it how remember kt ptgr but this is a different pod name now this is not the only thing we can do what we can do is we can um, scale up our deployment and because we're using the same external storage it can mount it so we can say kubectl scale and we can scale the deployment and the deployment we want to scale is this guy and the number of replicas uh, let's just make it three for example and this is what we want to scale and if we run we can see it says scaled and you can see those other pods are coming up so this is the one that we had um, but then the new one is let's just grab one of these new ones and if we go here grab this guy and from here we do kubectl exec minus it this pod and we do that dash bash and now we should see that we can go to the same storage directory and there it is and so if i do echo dash hostname hostname is here too and append it to this file this.txt when i go back over here i do cat this.txt we should see and there you go so this is not where we have multiple containers using the same volume we've shown that this is now multiple pods using the same storage and also the storage persists outside of their life cycle and not only the pods life cycle the whole deployment so for example we can if i exit this and i do let's do clean up and i do kubectl delete minus f and i delete this deployment and then i let's do clean up again and i do kubectl apply and i do minus f on this whole directory well the only thing that changed was the deployment so we create a new deployment and I do exit from here clear and I do kubectl exec minus it and let's just go into this pod now notice remember i just destroyed the entire deployment not even the pod but well i mean definitely the pod was destroyed too but including the deployment and now we do bash cd into storage and ls 
we should still see, and we do, our files there. And so that shows you how this persists. This is out storage outside of our even Kubernetes cluster. We could tear down this entire cluster, bring it back up, and the data is still going to be there because why? The storage is being provided from outside of the cluster. I have a network attached storage device, and I'm able to create NFS storage and expose it or export it onto the network so that any other thing that needs to mount it can mount it. But like I said, that's be way beyond what we're doing here. So I'm not going to get into how that's done. If you're interested in NFS stuff, definitely look it up. All right. So that's enough. I don't want this to go any longer, but just wanted to show you that the, what this was possible. The next video is going to be on namespaces, and then we're going to wrap up our stuff with Kubernetes here as we get to the end of the year so we can get into some other stuff that I promised two years ago that we're going to do. We'll try to get into that stuff. So if you're at the end of the video and you like the material and you are not subscribed, please consider subscribing. Um, if you're a returning subscriber, thank you so much. I really, really can't say how much I really appreciate you being a subscriber, you sticking with it, you just understanding that sometimes I get really busy and yeah, I can't thank you enough. So thank you for sticking with it and coming back and showing your support. If there's anything that I've shown that you didn't understand or you have trouble with or you need clarification, just leave a um, message in the you know, comment and I'll try to address that. Otherwise, please thumbs up the video, leave a comment, show some interaction. Hopefully, we can get the channel to grow. Thanks again. Take care. Stay safe. Bye.